dare to look into a world where you are vulnerable. Smile while the clueless glass shows what it sees, never knowing the beauty that lies beneath. Hello, fellow Earthlings. Sorry, I know that's a lot from some random dude at 9 a.m. here uh, for uh, everybody in attendance here. But I thought that we could actually give this a shot, all of you folks together. Let's try that one more time. Uh, if you're watching the live stream here in person, if you're watching it live right now, if you're, if you're watching the replay, if you could just turn to something biological in your surroundings, real or imagined, and on three, let's all say, hello, fellow Earthling. Ready? One, two, three. How'd that feel? Kind of awkward, right? It's got a little zest to it, introducing ourselves like that. And uh, maybe that discomfort you just felt, introducing yourself as an earthling, that's what I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into with you all today. Because our human perspective, the way that we view ourselves, the way that we view the world around us, that's what informs the questions and the answers that we're receiving about what it means to be a living thing. And we should be incredibly proud of ourselves as a people, as a species, for the amount of time, the amount of energy, and the amount of imagination that we have all spent trying to put ourselves in our proper cosmic context to correct for our flawed human perspective. In fact, as we speak, the James Webb Space Telescope, one of humanity's most powerful perspective busters, is coming online. It's a million miles from home, staring out into deep space time, probing the universe for clues as to whether or not there are other life forms out there. Now, as a notion guy, I'm here to let you in on a little bit of the shenanigans the space people are up to, because when they say that they're looking for life in the universe, usually what they mean is that they're looking for another water world that's likely to have life on it. Because this planet right here, our Earth, that is the only place we know 100% for sure to have life on it. I'm looking at a few out there right now. And ours is a water planet. If you were in our solar system asking for directions to Earth, there's a very good chance that you'll get lost in a bunch of space rocks. But if you ask for directions to our pale blue dot, to the one with the ocean on it, well, there's only one place that you're headed. So. That's the question I wanted to ask all of you folks here in attendance. What does it mean to you to be an earthling living on an ocean planet? Because to me, what it means is that we have this incredible opportunity to compare our reality on land to the reality that we're searching for out there in the stars, except not very far away, right here beneath the surface of our blue planet. And I can tell you that when you trade air for water, things get interesting very quickly. Suddenly, a tornado is no longer made of a vortex of wind. It might be a storm massive in scale of 10,000 big eye Trevally jacks swirling from sea floor to sea ceiling. And out there in the ocean, things will get a little bit disorienting, but don't worry, there are plentiful characters that we can recognize the roles of. Uh, I'll show you some of them right here. For example, there are plenty of proud parents out there beneath the waves. This is a large aggregation of market squid coming together to mate. And uh, what we're really seeing here is just a bunch of parents that are interested in setting up the next generation for success. And they've opted to invest in their squid kids by depositing them into a sandbank. All right, moving on. <laughs> Maybe further afield, you've got a solo artist looking to get away from the spotlight, an influencer of sorts trying to get its swimming head right by enjoying a little bit of a spa day with plentiful perch picking at its pesky parasites. This ocean sunfish, this mola mola, reminds me that self-care is just as important in the ocean as it is on land. Because after all, you never know in the ocean where the next sea monster may be lurking. And by sea monster, of course, I'm referring to this inch-long Hilton's Aeolid sea slug nudibranch, a prowling predator on the hunt for hydroid hideouts that are cowering in the current. This is a terrifying menace 
that is leaving a lot of you completely unimpressed. If you thought that I was gonna mention something a little bit more jawsome as a sea monster, maybe like this bull shark, well, I can tell you from personal experience that they tend to behave more bovine than beastly. This large female here, content to just be outstanding in her field, grazing the sand plains of Baja, California, and not interested in becoming another headline. Because no matter what you may hear or see about the ocean, we really don't know what it means to live there full time. I've been scuba diving now for a little bit over 10 years, and that's amounted to around 40 days spent beneath the waves. And there's still a lot that I have to learn. We have great teachers underwater, of course, from this two-spot octopus and all of those schoolmates there. And one of the lessons that I keep coming back to, something I have to remind myself of, is that if you live in a water world, it's important to always be looking up because that is where the pelagic magic happens. All of these animals behind me were photographed on one warm Hawaiian night, suspended one mile above the seafloor. Each one of them appeared to be at first to just be a bright speck flowing past me like a star in hyperspace. But upon closer inspection, each little mote of dust had that opportunity to meet a new life form. Some of these animals here are living out their most extravagant selves before settling into a more boring adult version that lives on the reef, while others will spend their entire life adrift at the mercy of current events, never really settling down, and that's totally fine because it's the journey, not the destination. And some of you folks in attendance here might recognize your life history in there somewhere. But when you hang out in the midwater, you realize that the ocean is not only full of life, the water itself can come alive. Like this beautiful sea goddess, Leucothea pulchra, the spotted comb jelly. This animal is a predator in the plankton, and yet this delicate deity has the consistency of wet tissue paper. A solitary swipe of your finger next to it could obliterate this booger being into a bunch of unrecognizable blobs. And these types of gelatinous animals are where the comparisons between our realities on land and in the ocean really start to break down. Because out there, you have animals like scyphozoans, hydrozoans, siphonophores, tenophores, salps, pyrosomes, and pteropods, just to name a few. Those are real words, I just said, that describe real animals that have no counterpart on land. Imagine you're hanging out at the bus stop with a buddy when suddenly the wind shifts and now there's a bloom of a billion buoyant breeze beasts blowing above you. And now you're no longer worried about the bus being late. Now you're concerned about some of this weaponized wind swooping down, carrying you away from that conversation and digesting your remains into a cloud. That is a conundrum that we don't really recognize living on land, but that ocean animals have to contend with. But there are some places out there in the ocean that are so known, so familiar to our minds that going there is like going home. I'm very fortunate to live right next door to these water woods, to this kelp forest. And when I'm not on land, there's a good chance that I'm right here in these vertical pews, watching the sun dance through the stained glass canopy of the Kelp Cathedral. This is not only what dreams are made of, but this is a place where dreams can come true. Because as opposed to any forest that you've been in on land, in this one, you get to fly, like an eagle soaring through an algal amphitheater, suspended weightless in inner space. Because exploring outer space, that tells us where we're from. But understanding inner space, that tells us who we are in this cosmic story. Because what if we find life out there on another ocean planet? What if during that introduction, their first question for us is, how is your ocean doing? Are we ready for that answer? Because it would be such a shame, such a tragedy for some silly piece of nomenclature to rob us of that deep understanding of ourselves that we're searching for. We know that the sun rises and we know that the sun sets and we also know that that's not true. The sun is fixed and it's us spinning in and out of its glow. So could it be that we named our home the wrong thing? 
I long so deeply for people to be able to see the stars above reflected in the sea stars below, to see the countless lights of the night sky right there mirrored in a bloom of bioluminescent plankton crashing upon the shores of this cosmic ocean. I believe that if we can break through together, if we can fix that last little piece of our perspective, that then we will really know what it means to walk the earth. And when the time comes, we will be able to adequately introduce ourselves to the cosmos. We are stewards of a misnomer. We are the proud earthlings of planet ocean. Thank you for your time. <laughs>